Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. Today's video is a bit of a different one for this channel as it'll detail something of mine that's a little personal. My personal computer. Bad lead ups aside, this video will be more tech focused than any of my previous videos and will have significantly less Sly Cooper content than usual. The reason for this video was simply due to my curiosity as I had recently gotten a new graphics card for my computer. I wasn't 100% confident in this purchase as my old graphics card was doing the job just fine, so I wanted to see whether the performance gain of my new graphics card was worth it. Of course, I, being as ambitious as ever, decided to also dust off a couple old CPUs that I used to have and put them to the test as well. Long story short, what was supposed to turn into a simple graphics card comparison quickly turned into a comparison between six different setups. Alright, so what exactly was I testing? For starters, the setup I used to use right before my current one involved a Ryzen 5 1600 processor, a Core i7 hexacore CPU. Yeah, we've got one, and it's an 8th generation chip, and it's ready to go, and it supports overclocking. And a Radeon HD 7970 graphics card from Sapphire. Both of these products are from AMD. The Ryzen 5 1600 was part of AMD's first generation Ryzen lineup, and played a good part in AMD's comeback in the CPU division. Released in mid-2017, the 6-core 12 thread CPU packed quite a punch compared to AMD's previous offerings, at just an MSRP of $199. US dollars. The graphics card, the Radeon 7970 from Sapphire, was one of AMD's first graphics cards to use its Graphics Core Next or GCN architecture, an architecture that is still iterated upon today in AMD's most recent mid-range offerings. I'll spare you further tech specs, but all I can say is that this card aged surprisingly well given that it released all the way back in January 2012. This brings me to the successor in my rig, the Radeon RX 580, also from Sapphire. This card is based on GCN 4.0 architecture, boasting higher clock speeds on a more efficient manufacturing process. As mentioned earlier in this video, I was initially interested in comparing only the two graphics cards against one another with my Ryzen 5 as the sole CPU. However, it was only a matter of time before I found more things to test. The most recent CPU I used to use before upgrading the Ryzen was my FX6300. This processor was released way back in October 2012, but I didn't get my hands on it until December 2015 for reasons that will be detailed. This is the 6 core, 6 thread processor, but like most of AMD's CPU lineup at the time, it didn't stand much of a chance compared to its competitor Intel in the single thread performance. While it had its uses, more often than not, Intel was the go-to CPU for gaming. This brings me to my final CPU in the test bench, and coincidentally my first CPU used in a gaming rig, the Athlon 2 X2 245. This sucker released all the way back in 2009 or 2010, and packed a 2-core, two 2-thread two CPU. It certainly wasn't blowing socks off, but it was able to get the job done, especially for my gaming needs at the time. Just to give you all a better understanding of my history with all of these parts, here's a brief timeline of what combinations I used when. Just to recap, my first gaming rig consisted of that 2-core, two 2-thread two Athlon CPU and the 7970 GPU. A year later, the CPU was upgraded to the 6-core, six 6-thread six FX6300 chip. One and a half years later, the CPU was again upgraded to my current 6-core, 12-thread Ryzen 5 1600, and lastly, a little over a year later to where we are today, I finally upgraded my graphics card from my trusty 7970 to the more modern RX 580. A few notes before I show you the numbers. This isn't a buying guide, rather it's a way for me to show how my personal rigs have performed over the years. Granted, if you know a bit about AMD CPUs, it should be pretty obvious that there will be a performance gain going from the FX CPU to the Ryzen, but I do want to make it clear that I benchmarked this for my own satisfaction and did not intend on making this into a recommendation or buying guide. Secondly, testing is as good as I could have made it, but it has its differences. For instance, due to platform differences, different types of memory had to be used, and these memory kits were different speeds, which I'll touch on shortly. There wasn't really any way around this, but I have tried to make all comparisons as similar as possible. Thirdly, frame rate data was not tested in a way that I would have preferred due to a lack of experience in doing this kind of testing. Most of this resulted from user error as I realized that some of my benchmarking methods were showing inaccuracies. Unfortunately, as I'll reiterate throughout this video, I didn't notice this until I was halfway through benchmarking, at which point I was already exhausted by my own ambition. 
I'll indicate which games the odd data specifically applies to as I go through their graphs, and I'll also touch on ways I should have improved my results near the end of this video. One last thing, here's a quick table of all of my test systems. As mentioned before, all systems have different speeds of RAM at equivalent capacities due to the nature of the platforms being tested. Additionally, due to space limitations, two SSDs were used to hold and run the games. However, all games were tested off of the same SSD for all test configurations, and this SSD will be indicated in the particular game's graphs. Alrighty, without further ado, let's go to the numbers. We'll start off by looking at synthetic benchmarks. Cinebench R15 is commonly used for stress testing CPUs, and it's used no differently here. The darker bar represents the multi-core score, where all threads are maxed out. As expected, the more threads there are, the higher the score ends up being. However, the single core score is what shows off AMD's innovation between its older CPUs and its Ryzen series, as the Ryzen CPU is 70% faster than the FX chip and a whopping 120% faster than the Athlon. As this is a CPU heavy benchmark, switching graphics cards while keeping the same CPU made little to no difference. Moving on to Unigine Valley, this is a more GPU focused benchmark, though it did also seem to put some load on the CPU, as the FX chip scored higher than the Athlon when both were paired with the RX 580. The Athlon especially is showing signs of being, it being the bottleneck, as its score with the 580 is lower than the FX score with the 7970. Nonetheless, the Ryzen results do show a 35% increase between the Radeon 7970 and the RX 580. Unigine Heaven is a more recent benchmark from Unigine and seems to minimize the confounding effect of the CPU. This is because the scores of the GPU stay the same or pretty close regardless of what CPU it's paired with. Here, the RX 580 is a whopping 55% faster than the 7970. Kinda crazy, but also expected, and it tends to be the trend throughout this video. Moving from synthetics to actual games, we'll start off with Assassin's Creed Unity. This game launched a little over 4 years ago in a very abysmal state, but it's safe to say that it's in a much better condition now. Of course, you'll still need reasonable hardware to take advantage of its beautiful architectures and endless NPCs. The Athlon can't quite keep up, keep up with this game even when tested at 720p on the lowest settings. The FX chip yields very playable results that are better than consoles, but doesn't leave much room to grow as adding an RX 580 increased performance by only 5%. With the Ryzen processor at the helm, going from the 7970 to the RX 580 increased average frame rate by a massive 52%, and even kept the game above 60 FPS almost all the time. Batman Arkham City is the second game in the Arkham series and came out all the way back in 2011, but still holds up fairly well by today's standards. The game wasn't very difficult to run, even for the Athlon, but the minimum frame rates did leave quite a bit to be desired. Interestingly enough, the RX 580 performed 2-5 frames worse than the 7970. Moving on to Batman Arkham Origins, this game set 5 years before the first Arkham game and came out in 2013. This game also wasn't too difficult to run, and in fact had higher frame rates than Arkham City. The RX 580 was able to show its true colors here, with improvements up to 50% in average frame rates. The low frame rates here are unfortunately very useless, as the in-game benchmark hitches right before the results screen, yielding an extremely low and unrepresentative minimum value. Unfortunately, as I mentioned before, I didn't notice this until I had already gone through the bottom three systems, as is the trend with some other missteps throughout this process. Moving on to data that makes almost as less sense is Far Cry 3. This game came out in 2012 and was praised for its memorable villains and story. It was also remastered in 2018, though that's not what was tested here. As is the trend, the Athlon can't hit 30 FPS, though it might have a chance if settings are lowered. The game's performance between the Ryzen and FX chips was a bit intriguing. The RX 580 performed worse than the 7970 when paired with the Ryzen processor, but neither pairing was able to hit the 60 FPS sweet spot. Fortnite Battle Royale is up next, because of course it is. While the Athlon does manage more than 30 FPS at some of the highest settings, it does so with some serious hitching and stuttering, and also isn't able to render some environments or buildings properly, making this an unplayable experience, especially for a multiplayer game. The FX CPU helped alleviate these issues, some of which can be seen in its improved minimum frame rate, and it really shines when it's paired with an RX 580. The RX 580 overall, when paired with a decent CPU, is the true winner here as it spit out average frame rate improvements upwards of 
best of all, the Ryzen 580 combo should be able to hit 60 FPS at all times by lowering a couple of settings. GTA 5 is still a popular benchmark to this day despite being released in 2015, and it's because of its PC friendly benchmark and a plethora of settings that can be modified to your heart's content. Unfortunately, this was also the first game where I had to give up on the Athlon. Not only was the game extremely slow to, slow to load, with loading times as long as 15 minutes, but the benchmark also failed at loading in assets when it was running. Frame rates might have been in the 40s, but the game looked unrendered and felt unplayable. Luckily, the game did see better states when it was given more cores to work with. The 7970 paired with either of the 6 cores spit out playable frame rates, and the RX 580 was able to boost frame rates by 25-30%. to 30%. You might notice here that instead of low frame rates, I'm using a 1% low here, rather than a minimum. This metric is actually how I initially wanted to test all the games here, as the 1% low usually gets rid of potential outliers that are introduced by the minimum. I'll talk about this more near the end of the video. The newest Hitman game was also tested, in both DirectX 11 and DirectX 12 modes. This was probably one of the more normal results, as results scaled as expected. The dual core Athlon couldn't really manage the benchmark that well, but the FX chip did allow for more performance to be obtained. Seeing as how the RX 580 added about 12% to the 7970, there is an indication that a CPU bottleneck was quickly approaching. Ryzen's 12 threads really kicked in here and showed the RX 580 to be a massive 63% increase in average frame rate over the 7970. Hitman's DX12 results showed similar trends and improvements. Interestingly enough, the RX 580 results were 6-8% better than its DX11 results. Just Cause 2 is another dated game, but a fun one that I go back to from time to time. Here the RX 580 made much less of a splash than we've seen so far, but it still helped improve frame rates by about 3 frames. Interestingly enough, this game was actually the game that motivated me to upgrade my Athlon to the FX back in the day. I'm glad I did, as there was an 83% performance improvement between the two. Going from the FX to the Ryzen chip isn't nearly as impressive, but certainly noticeable. The next game is Just Cause 3, a game that builds upon what Just Cause 2 did right while looking and playing more modern and performing, well, adequately. Unfortunately, it was very rare for me to get 60 FPS in this game when I had my Ryzen in 7970, even at 900p. The 1080p results here aren't much better, though the game is certainly playable. As expected, the Athlon is left in the dust as the FX chip speeds ahead, though it quickly reaches its bounds when it's paired with the RX 580. As someone who plays this game regularly just for kicks, I'm pretty happy to see the performance improvement that the RX 580 provides with the Ryzen processor. Mafia 2 is another old game, but damn if it doesn't have a solid story. The game is almost playable on the Athlon chip and quite playable on the FX processor. The Ryzen processor, however, helps the game hold 60 FPS at almost all times. Not much to say here as we've come quite accustomed to this trend at this point. Metro 33 and Metro Last Light are games that I've been meaning to play, especially now that Metro Exodus is coming closer and closer. The in-game benchmark is an interesting one, with lots of gunfire and lighting effects, and seemed quite resource intensive as evidenced by the minimum frame rates. However, the trends overall line up with what we've been seeing so far. Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor is a game that I dug quite a few hours into because of its bloody good combat and the nemesis system. Here when the game isn't being CPU bottlenecked, the RX 580 shows its performance gains, leading the 7970 by as much as 70% in average frame rates. With the amount of overhead the RX 580 and Ryzen pair gives, I'm eager to see how this game manages 1440p and even 4K. Quantum Break is probably the newest game in this lineup besides Fortnite, and despite it having a lukewarm launch back in 2016, it's a joy to play through in 2018. The game looks great and tells a compelling story while also having some very satisfying time powers. Unfortunately, another benchmarking blunder I made here was including the in-game cutscene as my starting point for this benchmark. Cutscenes in this game are fixed to 30 frames per second, meaning that the low frame rates for some of these configurations are at 30 FPS. That's not very useful, unfortunately. Nonetheless, the average frame rates do show that the RX 580 does lead the 7970 by quite a bit, and when paired with the Ryzen, is even able to hit that 60 frames per second sweet spot.
Rocket League is up next, and this game is pretty easy to run as it is an esports title. However, the Athlon did have quite a few stutters and is never able to hit 60 FPS, though I'd imagine that lowering a few settings and the resolution would help its case. The 7970 does a good job when paired with either the Ryzen or FX CPUs, but the RX 580 blows it out of the water with some massive average frame rates. This game is honestly making me consider a 144Hz monitor now. Rounding out the game benchmarks is the Tomb Raider reboot from 2013. This game was a pretty fun action adventure title that satisfied my uncharted thirst on PC. This game also still holds up pretty well today. I was honestly quite surprised when I first played this on my FX 7970 combination as the game played extremely well. Adding better components only increases the frame rate, though it's hard to ignore a massive 180 frames per second average from the top tier combination. Lastly, as I said, there was very little Sly Cooper, and this is going to be it. This was a very quick and dirty comparison as I played Sly 3 via PCSX2, the PS2 emulator, on my main computer's hard drive, not even an SSD. Additionally, this was only a GPU comparison as only the Ryzen CPU was used here, and only native resolutions of the game was changed. Let's just say that I'm glad that this isn't the sole benchmark I'm using to justify my purchase, because last time I checked, the 580 should have been a little better than this. Also, now's a good time to address the whole 1% lows and 0.1% lows that you've probably noticed in this graph. I mentioned earlier that these were the metrics that I wanted to measure as they were more meaningful than the minimum results. Essentially, 1% lows represent the value that the frame rate will be greater than 99% of the time. Similarly, 0.1% lows represent the value that the frame rate will be greater than 99% of the time. There's a bit more to this metric, but I've linked some reading down below if you want to know more about this. Basically, these special lows help account for and eliminate potential outliers in the data, such as stutters, hitches, or freezes. The lack of information can actually be seen with my Batman Arkham Origins results. Quite frankly, those low frame rates are garbage in their meaning, but measuring 1% lows would have helped paint a more representative picture of Arkham Origins' performance. GTA 5, on the other hand, provides a built-in metric for 1% lows, which was shown in my graph. The question still remains, why did I show low frame rate results instead of those 0.1% 1% lows? The reason why was because my trust in my measuring tool, Rivatuner Statistics Server, was misplaced. One of their most recent updates included 1% and 0.1% low calculations, so I went ahead with it only to realize that the 1% lows are lower than the minimum frame rate. In other words, instead of eliminating the outliers, the 1% lows became the outliers. This was the case in almost every single one of my benchmark runs, and I ran each game's benchmark 3-4 to four times. Unfortunately, as mentioned before, I was already almost halfway through my testing and was already running out of physical testing space, so I opted to use the minimum results that I had already obtained. Not ideal at all, and certainly a learning experience. Additionally, there are also some other minor areas that I could have improved on, such as different games being on different SSDs. Ideally, all games should have been on one SSD to eliminate any sort of potential differences caused by different SSD speeds, but those are the only ones I had on hand and I didn't want to pay more on top of the $220 or so that I'd already spent on the RX 580. If you guys are interested in high standards of benchmarking, I'd highly suggest checking out channels like Gamers Nexus or Hardware Unboxed as they are very thorough and transparent in their testing methodologies and they produce high quality content almost every day. Alright, enough of the doom and gloom, what do my results say? Well, I'm honestly pretty happy with my purchase of the RX 580. While I do wish it was able to hit 60 FPS in all of the games tested, Far Cry 3 being the most memorable where it didn't, the performance gain it showed in all the other tests completely blew me away and made me very eager to replay these games with my shiny new hardware at higher frame rates and even potentially higher resolutions. Additionally, testing every piece of hardware I've ever owned while taxing was also quite intriguing and taught me a lot about what goes into benchmarking. If you guys enjoyed this video, feel free to hit that like button. If you're new here and want to see content that's probably not going to be like this, feel free to subscribe. Feel free to check out my previous content, that's probably what I'll upload more of honestly. And let me know what your thoughts are in the comments down below. Feel free to, you know, tell me where I could have improved my methods, I'm all ears, uh, even though this probably won't happen for a long time. And feel free to join my Discord server if you're on Discord. All links are in the description down below. As always, thanks again for watching, and I hope I'll see you in my next video.